Our next speaker is Jeff Chang, who is the author of the American Book Award winning Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip Hop Generation. Did, was there a little outburst of cheering there? Is that what was that? Okay. And editor of Total Chaos, The Art and Aesthetics of Hip Hop. He is currently writing two new books, and he's not even up for tenure, are you? No. Who We Be, The Colorization of America, uh, which is being published by St. Martin's Press, and Youth, the Picador Big Ideas Small Book Series. Jeff was the ASUC president during 1988 to 1990, uh, 1989. Okay. <laughs> and was extensively involved in the anti-apartheid and racial justice movements and in organizing against budget cuts to higher education. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. And uh, Louis, sorry about that. And thank you to SAVE, uh, and thank you to all of you for coming out tonight, uh, despite the weather and all the other stuff that's going on. Um, I wanted to kind of build on what Dr. Kerp and Dr. Rafer were talking about, but first I gotta say this, all right. So I'm surfing the interweb, right? And uh, I come across a picture of a banner that's been hung at one of the campuses, and it says, March 4th. Hella strike. <laughs> now, yeah, March 4th, hella strike, right? And I, I'm, okay, so, you know, I'm a writer, I work with words. Um, you know, I, I've been in the yay for 25 years, I know my slang. Um, yeah, and some of you might have heard I'm a hip hop head, right? But I don't think that that's grammatically correct. <laughs> but I agree with the sentiment, because in California, we don't just strike. We hella strike. So you know that tomorrow, again, you're striking in this great tradition of protest, uh, protest for change, the Third World Strike in 1969, the Ethnic Studies Strike in 1999, the strikes, the hunger strikes, the walkouts against apartheid, against the wars, right, against police brutality, for uh, unionization of TAs, for civil rights, for justice for immigrants. You know that others have come be before you, you know that many others will come behind you, you're part of an unbroken chain. At the same time, I'm also aware that every generation mythologizes itself. Um, as a student, you know, 25 years ago, I sat in the same seats that you're sitting in. And I was inspired and awed by the veterans of the 1960s, right? who uh, were imploring us to, to move things forward. But recently I sat again in the seats that you're sitting in as an older person and I, I watched people of my generation imploring people of your generation forward and I saw it all a little bit differently. I realized that my peers were asking you to take up battles that we did not win. Just as previous generations had asked us to take up battles that they did not win. Every generation, no matter how smart, no matter how correct, right, leaves an unfinished agenda. As a great artist and activist, Faith Ringo told me, we do, we can and we do open doors, but doors will close too. The lesson is not that we should give up fighting. The lesson is that fighting is a lifetime thing. It is something that is picked up in each generation it's something that's passed on to the next generation. The lesson is that we need to show respect to those whom the battles are being passed to, to you all. To say that we'll continue to fight, but that we'll also honor the fact that increasingly you will lead. So the time comes when it's important for us to reaffirm what it is that we are fighting for and to pass on the tools that may inform your leadership. We are fighting for institutions that are accountable to the people, for institutions that produce peace, equality, and freedom, that will not reproduce violence, inequality, and injustice. And in a multiracial society, we cannot achieve these aims without addressing race and class. First, we should remember that diversity used to be a radical word. Again, to kind of paraphrase, paraphrase George Clinton, right? 
it, it's been only two generations since people of color were virtually invisible in higher education in the state of California. History dictated that they weren't supposed to be here. But because people fought, I was in the first freshman class at UC Berkeley to be more than 50% non-white, to reflect the diversity of the state of California. Much has changed. When I graduated, Chicanos and Latinos made up 60% more of the freshman admissions than they do now. African Americans made up 260% more of freshman admissions than they do now. Now over the past few weeks, we've seen the headlines on hate crimes across the UC system. What does it mean that even as American popular culture has desegregated, that our neighborhoods and our schools from kindergarten all the way up through higher education have seen undeniable, significant resegregation. What does it mean that at the same time we claim to have reached a landmark point in history, we've elected a black president, that we, in fact, seem to be moving backwards in trying to achieve racial equality, that hate crimes are back on the rise, that the UC system is less representative of California than it was two decades ago, that the leaders of our institutions refuse to engage the gaps between symbolism and reality. It means that diversity, as a word, must be reclaimed and re-radicalized. It means that now we must continue the fight for real integration. Real integration means a society in which benefits are available and distributed equally to all. But for four decades, the right has mobilized fears of race and youth to try to stop the fight for real integration. California's been ground zero. You already know the history of how this has played out with respect to Proposition 13 uh, in terms of state resources. These are the politics of abandonment, a retreat of electorates from the spaces that are no longer predominantly white. And these politics continue. You see it in the destruction of great cities like Detroit and New Orleans. Let me remind you, too, of a recent history that is less often told, but just as critical to understanding where it is that we are at now. In 1992, after the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles, we saw the rapid rise of a racial backlash. If right-wingers have used the shock doctrine to press free market reforms into spaces and on people devastated by war, they have also used the fear doctrine to move the state to press the politics of containment on spaces and on people that have been devastated by abandonment. So right after the riots, in quick succession, we saw the passage of Proposition 184, right? The three strikes law, largely directed at black and Latino youths. Proposition 187, the initiative that banned social services to undocumented immigrants, was so invidious that it was ruled unconstitutional. Proposition 209, of course, that banned affirmative action. Proposition 227, that banned bilingual education. And finally, Proposition 21, the anti-youth initiative that capped the rising tide of laws targeting young people, and especially young people of color. You can see the continuation of the politics of abandonment and containment in the rise of the so-called Tea Party movement, which is simply the return of far-right populism. It may not specifically be, uh, appear to be about race, right? It's about Obamacare. Uh, it's about big government. It's about letting the market fix itself, uh, unless, of course, it's about shoring up the private institutions that failed in that marketplace. But the Tea Partiers are not scared the most about socialism. They love their Medicare, right? They're scared of the country that they see uh, emerging. They're scared, they're scared of the country that they see every day uh, in their president's face. They're scared of the country that they see walking through the schools of California every single day. They're scared of youth and they're scared of race. And that is why they fight so fiercely to disengage, to run away from any notion of community, to exit society completely, but only after they've completely devastated it and built a wall around everyone and everything that they've left behind. The battle of your time, the battle that we have left you, is to begin to reverse these politics, to rebuild communities that have been torn asunder from each other, 
to replace fear and hatred with commitment and engagement. And resegregation may, the, may be the most important domestic issue that we face in our time because it's the most deeply rooted. It's the cause of our misery and it's the result of our negligence. Nationally, 44% of all students of, uh, under the age of 18 are now of color. But that number doesn't even begin to get at what's happening uh, at the school level. Since 1988, integration has deteriorated rapidly because of market-driven uh, housing patterns and the ongoing backlash against civil rights laws at the judicial and the legislative level. Blacks and Latinos on average attend schools that are less than 30% white and more than 58% low income. But in fact, white students are the most segregated of all. Whites on average attend schools where more than three-fourths of their fellow students are also white, and less than one-third of the students there are low income. In other words, white students attend the least poor and the least racially diverse schools uh, in America, and it's getting worse. This is the context for the university's recent policy-making uh, decisions around admissions, which contradict its stated goals of maintaining diversity. The UC wants not only to reduce in-state admissions and enrollments, but to further reduce racial diversity on the campuses. Last February, the Board of Regents passed a new freshman admissions and eligibility policy that reduces the percentage of guaranteed admissions from 12.5% of California's graduating seniors to 10%. And in turn, it supposedly expands the number of students of color who can be reviewed in this process. What the university did not explain then and will not explain now is why their own studies show that potentially thousands more students of color would be rejected under this new policy than under the current one. According to its own stimulation, uh, simulations, African American admissions in the UC system could drop by up to 27%. Asian Americans by 11% and Chicanos and Latinos by 3%. Having already obliterated real diversity once in the 90s, the university seems ready to do it again with the budget crisis as its defense and under the cover of the notion of merit. Now, merit's always been a fiction, a distillation of political priorities at any given moment. Back in the 80s, a year after UC Berkeley admitted its first majority non-white freshman class, it instituted a range of policies that discriminated against Asian Americans. There was just too much diversity then. And there seems again to be too much diversity now. We forced the doors open and they, they closed them again. Some people say we live in a post-racial society. Some people say we live in a post-racist society. And yet, if you look at what's been happening at UC San Diego, we don't seem to advan have advanced very far from the 1960s or from even the 1980s. Look how quickly the opposition to the black student union's demands coalesced and around what tropes. The frat party oh, was thrown by a, a black man. Not true and not the point. The news saw it must have been hung by a black woman. Not verifiable and not the point. From the LA riots through now, the mainstream narrative is that no other kind of racism can exist except one in which whites do not participate consciously or unconsciously. And I don't say that to argue that the burden of addressing racism goes to whites alone. That would be ridiculous and wrong because the persistence of racism benefits many, inclu including many who are non-white. I'm saying this to get us to challenge the idea that disengagement is virtuous. It begins with a small lie. Teaching your child, right, that Recognizing race is in itself racist, that's a lie. And it moves on up to bigger lies, like the lie that because we have disengaged from race, we now live in a post-racist society, that inequality no longer exists, that there's no such thing as racial justice left to achieve. So this fight is much more, about, uh, much more than just about the university. We have to see the big picture. Yes, let's talk about how the state's priorities have to shift from incarceration to education, but let's not abandon our own who are on the other side of that line. To be about liberation education is to first be about liberation, to enfranchise the disenfranchised. 
what institution in society has thrown its doors uh, open to people of color more than prisons? Who in society is more disenfranchised than prisoners? We should be talking, as Angela Davis and George Lipsis put it, about an abolition democracy. We should be talking about what it would take to make prisons obsolete. We cannot imagine a healthy educational system without imagining a healthy community and a healthy society. And these are the stakes of the fight. So we need to stop the UC admissions policy. We need to stop the fee hikes. We need to stop the budget cuts. We need to restore jobs. We need to restore access. These are urgent and necessary issues. But we are also fighting a larger fight. We are fighting to turn around political and fiscal abandonment. We are fighting to end isolation and containment. We are fighting to model commitment and engagement. We are fighting to restore community. We are fighting for the presence and protection of radical diversity. We are fighting for real integration that brings us all towards peace, towards freedom, towards justice. And so again, the odds might seem long, change seems impossible, but that is why we must fight. That is why we must demand everything. Three, four generations have demanded everything. We and time and again, we've been beaten down, but we still keep coming back year after year because we deserve more and we've been getting less and less. Tomorrow, students in Florida, Nevada, Washington, Texas, Wisconsin, New Jersey, Georgia, New York, 20 other states will be walking out of their classes as well. They too will be on strike. So when you take to the plaza and to the streets, and to the halls of power, let them know that on behalf of all the students that came before and that are out there now that are not with you, you are making a stand and you will not go away. When your generation goes out there tomorrow and for the rest of your lives, strike against abandonment, strike against containment, strike for community, strike for radical diversity, just hella strike. <laughs> and we will be out there following.